Well, hello everyone. Thanks for your patience. We're trying to work out some of the technology here. Um, for those of you who are not um, familiar with Benavia, I'm Daphne Vincent in Donor Relations. We have been in existence since 1981. We used to be called Interfaith. Some of you may have known us by that. Um, we started as a support for people that were aging in place in Sun City, Sun City West. At the time, it's hard to believe we didn't have the Royal Oaks and the Colonnade and all these lovely communities. We didn't have a lot of support. Um, people had to take loved ones to, to Phoenix for that. So um, Benavia started by providing some social services to people that included transportation to doctor's appointments and grocery shopping and then opened adult day programs for people that had dementia and other forms of memory loss. So we currently have four different um, facilities that deal with different stages of dementia and or intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, we have been able to reopen some of our programs at limited capacity um, in September, whereas we had to close for several months during the worst part of the COVID pandemic, but we've learned a lot about protecting our members. So we're doing that. And we are limited in our um, services to the community, but we still are doing grocery shopping, just not in person. It's more like delivery to the door. We don't take them to the store and um, emergency medical, medical appointments and pharmacy services. So those are some of the things that we provide. If you or any of your community members are in need of that, especially during the time of COVID, when some people may be able to drive, but they are so vulnerable to go out in public right now that they need someone to bring them their groceries. And I know a lot of community members are helping each other as well, which is a beautiful thing. So. Um, we will send a follow-up email following this presentation with a copy of the presentation and some information about Benavia for those of you who are not familiar. Um, and of course, if you aren't already getting our emails and you want to know about all the different educational sessions we have that include everything from caring for people to, you know, estate planning, getting your best bang for your buck from your taxes and all of that. We have these sessions all Zoom right now. Normally they're in person. So we look forward to the day we can do that again. So um, what we're going to do, a few housekeeping items. We have a very large group today. And as you all probably are aware, sometimes being on the phone when people are asking questions in lifetime, it gets a little chaotic. So we're gonna keep you all muted during this presentation. So if you just jot down any questions that you might have during the session, we will open it up for questions and answers at the end of the presentation. Um, and like I said, we will also send a copy so you don't have to take such copious notes. So I'm very um, pleased to um, introduce the square that says Lindsey Brown is actually um, Tony Nelson and Lindsey Brown from Managed Protective Services. And they are a, a wonderful community service that um, helps individuals uh, manage their health, their finances and everything, especially if they are alone or they don't have family that they can count on to take care of them properly. Um, so they have a lot of things to share with you. Some of you are very familiar with what a fiduciary is and some of you may not even know. So you guys have the floor um, and then Anna, uh, Annalita will share your presentation when you're ready to do so. All right, and we'll just let her know when to go to the next slide too. Okay. Thank you. Hi everybody, I'm Lindsay. I am actually a licensed fiduciary with Managed Protective Services. I'm Tony Nelson. I'm the senior case manager with Managed Protective Services. Um, just maybe have Lindsay and I give you a little background on our history. So I came from um, inpatient work over in Wickenburg. I worked for a dual, uh, dual diagnosis center where I did manage, uh, case management there. Lindsay? I actually have an extensive background as a uh, certified paralegal with uh, history, extensive history within uh, probate, estate planning, trust law. So a lot to do with elder law. So we've both been with Jane Ann's company. I believe you've been here two years. Two years, yeah. Two years. I've been here almost seven years. Um, so we're very familiar with what we do. It's kind of nice. Our office has multiple people that, so we have a social work side and we have a financial side to our fiduciary office, which a lot of fiduciaries don't. 
So we're going to start with the slideshow to kind of introduce what a fiduciary is for those of you who have questions. And then we'll, we'll kind of go into there and, on scenarios and when it would be appropriate for you maybe to reach out to a fiduciary. All right, and Elisa, would you go to the first slide, please? Are you seeing that? We've got the managed protective services up. We we're looking for the slide that says uh, the second one, I guess it would be. There you oh, go. I'm sorry. Thank yes. you. There you go. Okay. All right. So what is a fiduciary? Um, first and foremost, in order to become a fiduciary, you actually have to, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, be vetted. Be vetted. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You have to you have to request to take a test within the Supreme Court. They have a licensing division, which then what you do is once you're approved, you can go ahead, go in and sit for a test, which is approximately, I would say, about two hours long that uh, will go over all the different different uh, dynamics of estate planning, what uh, fiduciaries role concerns ethical laws and probate laws. And if you pass that test, then what the Supreme Court does within that licensing division is you go through a FBI background check. So it's, it's quite um, a lengthy process to where they will have the FBI go in and research a specific person and their entire background. They check your credit. Uh, they also go through any schooling. So any work history, they will pull your trans excuse me, your transcripts. So personally, I, I attended Phoenix College and got my degree at Phoenix College for uh, legal studies. So they did reach out to Phoenix College. They requested all that information and they have to verify that your education and your work experience is up to par with their standards before they will ever issue a license to become a fiduciary because of the fact that, um, as you can see on our first slide, you actually assume the role and become personally responsible for that person. And whether it's their financials or also in Tony's uh, position as well as, as their health. Um, a fiduciary is someone who ex accepts the responsibility for taking care of the needs of property or another person for the, their specific benefit. So everything that you do as a fiduciary has to be for the benefit of that specific client or person. Uh, the fiduciary serves in a high role of tr trust to the ward. The person served by the fiduciary places all of their trust and responsibility to manage their financial affairs, their medical affairs, and just for their benefit. Um, the ele element of trust becomes crucial when that specific person has been deemed incapacitated. Um, they could be, you know, medically frail. They could be extremely vulnerable uh, mentally, uh, and they just don't have the ability to take care of things that a, that a normal person like we would on a day-to-day -day basis, where it's, you know, checking your account balances or you're getting something in the mail that says you've won a million dollars. And sometimes people can be coerced into believing those things and they don't have that, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, Capacity? The capacity to know the difference between right and wrong. They're, they're in a very vulnerable, fragile stage. Um, they may just not have anybody to talk to. So individuals will, will latch on to other situations to feel involved and included. So they become very vulnerable if they're left alone or there's no family involved. Right. Yeah. Somebody to kind of like do those checks and balances that, that you and I would do on a day to day basis. Um, we can be nominated in any kind of estate planning format. So whether that's a trust or a will or a financial power of attorney, medical power of attorney, or we could also be appointed as a guardian and conservator by the courts here in Arizona, which is, um, I feel like it's kind of like a forced power of attorney or forced, uh, medical power of attorney for somebody that can no longer make those decisions and has no one else to help them whatsoever. 
Um, and Alita, do you want to go to the next slide for us, please? So our licensure is statewide here in Arizona, um, and it can carry over into any county in particular. Uh, we work very closely with all of the probate courts here in Arizona. And uh, sometimes a lot of our services fiduciaries serve with a fee. Um, and those fees are mandated by, by, the, courts. by the courts. We right. have to do court accountings every year. Just because our bills are what they are at the end of the year, the judge still can come back and say, you know what, I get it. You did a lot of work on this case, but the sustainability of the estate is only going to allow the estate to pay you this much. So we are bound by what the courts allow us to pay ourselves as well. Yeah, and the other good thing too about Arizona and being a fiduciary in Arizona is that you are only charging for the work that we do. Uh, whereas in like, say for instance, California, they can take a percentage of the entire estate and just put it in their, you know, into their bank, I guess you could say. And I think it's 1.5% in California. But whereas in here in Arizona, it's specific for, we only bill for the work that is done. That's it. And, and one of the nicer things I can say is, one of the biggest things is that I hear people balk at our fiduciary fees. They are expensive, not going to lie. A private fiduciary can cost a lot of money. But the beauty of a private fiduciary is, is especially what somebody is being exploited. We stop the bleeding of the estate. We come in and our fees are going to be a lot less than the bleeding out that's been happening. We had one client, for instance, who was taken from us $250,000. Our bills are not going to be that. We, we stepped in, we stopped the bleeding of the estate and in situations where maybe they were taken for just about everything that they have with a proper court ordered guardianship and conservatorship, we can do a proper medical financial and medical evaluation, spend them down and get them approved for all techs appropriately rather than if they are just left languishing with no funds left. All right, all right. Annalita, can you go to the next slide please? Thank you. So as kind of what, you know, Tony and I have already discussed is these are the types of roles that we serve as fiduciaries. Uh, the guardianship and the conservatorship, that's where it is the board or the person client has been deemed incapacitated by a medical a medical provider or a doctor? Correct. So normally we get what's um, called a physician's questionnaire. So that has to be filed with the court as the legal document that we reach out to a current medical provider and we say, does this person still have capacity to nominate a power of attorney or do you feel that they no longer have capacity to make that decision and the courts need to intervene? The other roles, like I had stated prior, was trustee, successor trustee, powers of attorney. Those uh, two are usually typically done when you are meeting with either an attorney or a legal document preparer and setting up all of the estate planning needs and, and that you are requesting. Um, a lot of times, you know, clients or people would prefer that a neutral third party does take this, the position of the trustee of the power of attorney just to take all the pressure and the uh, if there was any animosity or anything like that between family members. There can be a lot of family dynamics that are going on. We had one situation where the daughter had cancer. Her dad was in his 90s with dementia and was at the point where he was accusing her of stealing everything. He was accusing her of, you know, getting the doctors to plot against him. And she just couldn't handle that with her cancer diagnosis. So even though she was his power of attorney, his trustee, she came and nominated our company to help manage that because she wanted to gain that relationship back with her father. She was able to say, look, dad, it's not me making these decisions. She put it all off on me. Right. I was the bad guy. Yeah. And, and that <laughs> helped bomb their relationship again. And, and they, when he did pass away, she was so grateful. And we actually helped her with her final estate planning um, because her children, once again, she did not want her children to have to make those decisions for her. So we were able to step in and help that family full circle. Yeah. Definitely alleviates a lot of that that uh, family dynamic and and helps them maintain their great relationship within each other when it within their own families. So that way, there's no blame game. And if you want to blame us, we are more than okay with taking that. <laughs> we, we take it all the time. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do. Um, and then, like Tony had said in the past, she she uh, is our geriatric case manager. 
So she does a lot of that. Uh, special needs trusts um, are specifically set up for, uh, like the word says, anything to do with special needs. Um, those, those are very extensive um, and typically attorneys will write those. So if you uh, have any questions about those, we can go over that at the end. Analita, can you do the next slide, please? I'm gonna take this. <laughs> so basically as stated, um, we, when we become a guardian conservator, we're appointed by the courts. We are legally bound and ethically bound to the courts. Um, we have to do annual guardianship reports to the courts. We have to do annual accountings to the courts. The courts basically watch everything that we do and are involved. So we, once again, the roles are split. We have people in the office handling financial, people in the office handling the estate part of it. Now we have cases where maybe the family is, we have a lot of snowbirds here who are retired here and maybe their kids are in a different state. Well, mom's starting to decline maybe and they call us up and they say, hey, you know what? We want you to be in charge of the guardianship part of it, but we're fine with handling the financials from a distance. So we have cases where we will come in and just be the guardian, but go to the family and they handle all the financial affairs. But they like the fact that we're kind of boots on the ground right here and, and we're taking care of everything that needs to go on health-wise for their parents. Um, I think that pretty much. Uh, and once guardianships can be permanent and temporary, we've also done guardianships, uh, co-guardianships once again so maybe families out of state and if parents did not have their documents in place beforehand there's no power of attorney and mom and dad maybe are beyond the point where uh they can actually facilitate a power of attorney we step in we do the guardianship and maybe we do the co-guardianship with another family member because the family member wants to be involved but once again they don't want to do the court accountings they don't want to do <laughs> all the you know because they will as a guardian still have to report to the courts so they hire us to be co-guardian with them so we handle all the legalities of it. Right. All right, and Alita, next slide, please. All right, so a conservator is, if you think about a conservator, that's anything to do with liquid assets, real property, tangible personal property. As a conservator, we are awarded that responsibility by the courts to take on those things and manage those things, dot every T or dot every I, cross every T, as far as the court is concerned. We have to document every little thing um, and they are, we are under strict scrutiny for that as well. We have to prove that we are actually benefiting the client um, and serving them with, with what they are, what is the word I'm looking for? I apologize. Um, giving them the, what is, shoot, I can't even think about it. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Anything to do with their benefit. Um, and so we will pay all their bills. Sustainability. Sustainability. That's the word I was looking for. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> uh, we have to preserve every asset that we can for their right. care and for their needs. And what, all, what else I like about being a conservator is that we carry on their traditions. So if they love, you know, magazines or they love the, you know, a specific channel or um, gifting you know, to their grandchildren, gifting. we have to, by the law of the courts, we have to follow what their case in history was before. So if they had a history of gifting $500 to every grandchild, as the conservator, as long as there's sustainability to do that, we do that. Now, once again, we propose a budget. So if we come in and a client has millions of dollars, they're sustainable, we're, we're not worried about this then we're going to continue a plan in action. But if we come in and maybe the ward is spent down and they only have $100,000 in the bank, we have to show a sustainability budget. Okay, we know we pay the care home $3,000 a month and all you know their living expenses, maybe we spend down in two to three years and that's our sustainability budget, two to three years with a proper Altex spend down. And we make sure that they're in an Altex approved facility as it is to make sure that they don't have to move again, that everything transitions and, and everything remains the same. Right, yeah, consistency is, is very big with- Continuum of care. Right, right. for conservator and guardian as well. Um, okay. All right, and Alita, next slide, please. All right, so a trustee and a successor trustee is a little bit different than that of a a conservator or a guardianship. Like I said, the conservator and the guardianship is a little bit more forced by the courts, whereas a trustee and a successor trustee 
is typically done through the nomination of estate planning documents. Um, it's very similar though. We have that same responsibility, that same role to take care of the client. That is our main priority. Uh, but the difference is, is that typically, now typically it's not always like that. Um, we have run into certain situations and things like that, but the trust is, is done without court oversight. It is done with the sole responsibility, the sole trust of the entire, you know, the client's entire liquid, real property, tangible personal property that we maintain the trust for the benefit of our client. It's the same aspect, but less court involvement. And then of course, once, you know, the original trustees, if they no longer are with us and have passed, then we go on and distribute that to the beneficiaries. We make sure that they are uh, provided with any type of accountings, bank statements, anything that they might require so that way they can see and provide that oversight for us. And if they have any questions or concerns, then of course we address those as they come up. But again, it alleviates all the pressures and the stigmas and the animosity and things like that that can unfortunately sometimes be created out of trusts and estates. We take the blame. <laughs> All right, Annalita. Oh, great. Look at that. You're already on the next one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Very similar power of attorney. Um, it is typically done through the nomination of a, a company like ourselves, a fiduciary that um, is done through estate planning. And you can do that through either an attorney or an, a legal document preparer here in Arizona. Um, and it basically allows us as fiduciaries to act in your stead act in your place, act in your footsteps without court approval, without the court involvement. So again, it's a little bit less costly to the estate if you uh, happen to nominate a neutral third party, a licensed fiduciary like ourselves uh, to take over those things for you. Um, different types of powers of attorney, uh, again, is medical, financial. There's springing and non-springing. Uh, springing means that what that does is that only puts power into your power of attorney or to your power of attorney once you have been deemed incapacitated by a doctor. Um, sometimes it says two doctors. Yeah, sometimes you can have it written to where you need two different opinions in order for that power of attorney to go into effect. Uh, the second type was the non-springing, and what that does is that automatically puts that person that you have nominated or that fiduciary into a position of power immediately. Once it's executed, that person can act on your behalf at any time. It's a little bit more rare, but sometimes, like Tony had said, when family is out of state, it sometimes can come in handy and especially with banks, because they take forever to process any kind of documents, but it automatically allows that person to start assisting with you in, in whether it be medically or financially. And a power of attorney is one of the greatest tools that you can have. I, I recommend to everybody, if you don't have to have a fiduciary involved, you don't want a fiduciary involved. Get your powers of attorney done. If you want to nominate a fiduciary because there are family dynamics or so there's nobody else, once again, this is the much, this is more cost effective than having to go through a court ordered guardianship and conservatorship. Now, we're not saying that a power of attorney protects you 100% because we do have a lot of cases where, unfortunately, the power of attorney is the one who is taking advantage of the situation. They don't understand that that money has to solely be spent on the ward and it cannot benefit them at all. And we have a lot of powers of attorney who think, oh, I have access to all this money now. I'm going to buy myself a new car. I'm technically going to inherit this money anyways when they die. I'm going to start spending it now. Unfortunately, you cannot do that. So we've had to step in and, and honestly go to the courts and have powers of attorney rescinded and do a guardianship and conservatorship. So make sure whoever you nominate, you trust them. Make sure you have a secondary person on there, somebody that you trust in case the first in place, like we had a woman who had nominated her, her friend a very short period of time and she's in her 90s, but at least had nominated her, her nephew as secondary. Well, the friend had exploited her in the less than a year to the tune of over $100,000 we were able to step in through the courts, get that power of attorney, basically her taking off the power of attorney legally 
and have the secondary nominated as the first because she was no longer able to act. So we are able to step in and help with a lot of those issues because we will see people incapacitated being offered to sign new documents by a housekeeper, a landscaper, somebody who wants to take this away. We can go into the courts and actually work with your doctor and say, look, this person was deemed incapacitated three years ago, but they, they go ahead and sign a new power of attorney in 2017. We can get, the, we can help with getting the courts to basically, you know, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? <laughs> uh, to basically nullify, revoke, revoke, there you go, revoke Re their powers. Yes. So those are things too, because people will see that like, oh my God, you know, once again, I have another gentleman just got a phone call, very sad situation. The son didn't realize a woman had stepped in, gotten dad to sign a power of attorney six months ago. Dad was deemed incapacitated in 2017. He didn't know that anything had changed till his dad ended up in the hospital on life support. And his dad did unfortunately pass away this weekend, but he was completely, you know, blindsided. blindsided by the situation that he no longer was in charge of things. So we are helping him go through the courts to basically, um, um, basically, uh, Pursue legal action. Pursue or? legal action to um, get the courts to basically rescind any authority that she had and make him in charge of her, 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 the will again. So, yes, very, very, very important um, that any person that you nominate is a person that you trust 100%. Um, like I said, it doesn't have to be a fiduciary, but again, fiduciaries do have to go through that full vetting process, like right. we talked about in the beginning. I would also recommend that if you have anybody that there is a question of capacity, if you, you know, maybe getting mom and dad to sign a new power of attorney and they're in their eighties and somebody, cause you never know when money is involved, weird dynamics happen between families where if this brother may say, Hey, you had mom sign that she didn't have capacity six months ago. Always get a doctor's note to back it up. Always have a doctor write on a script, write on something that says as of this state, so-and-so had capacity to sign a power of attorney. That way nobody can dispute what you did was legal. And it doesn't have to be full capacity. It could be testamentary capacity Correct. Um, to know what they are signing and to be aware of what they are signing and to understand the role of the power of attorney, to understand the role of a rep personal representative or a trustee. Um, it doesn't have to be full capacity. It could just be testamentary capacity as well. Um, Annalita, can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. This is the personal representative is something that happens after a person has passed. Um, the power of attorneys that we were just talking about, those uh, cease to have any kind of power behind them once that person has passed. Um, if once appointed as personal representative, then what we would need to do, depending on uh, whether or not there is a, an estate that is large enough here in Arizona, the estate cutoff, the financial cutoff is 75,000. So if your estate is less than 75,000, technically you wouldn't necessarily need, yeah, need to go to a probate court in order to, uh, what is the word, close out the estate. Whereas if anything is over 75,000 and that's what that's including liquid assets, meaning financials in the money in the bank, if you would say, or investment accounts, life insurance policies, so on and so forth. Or also you have to do the combined total of if there's any real property involved, which is real estate, any type of land here in Arizona is worth more than 75,000. As a personal representative, our role here is to then liquidate the estate and distribute any of those funds to the beneficiaries. And what we do is we go in, we marshal all the assets, we take extensive inventories and get those inventory, the property, whether it's most of the time, it's personal, tangible personal property that's inventoried, we get it appraised. And then we obviously would associate a value to those items. Um, all of this information is then provided to the beneficiaries that we work hand in hand with them to make sure that they are well aware of what is going on. Um, we close out any bills that may be outstanding. Uh, we also go through a creditor's claim, which allows, let's say for instance, uh, Citibank to come in and you know collect that $2,000 that's owed on that one visa. That's typically what a creditor's claim is for. 
Um, we also go through and locate any heirs if they're not nominated or listed. Uh, here in Arizona, there are specific succession laws when it comes to people's estates, and we could go over that later. Um, and then again, we just distribute any remaining assets once those all those bills are completely paid and we are ready to close out the estate. We administer that and then distribute all those funds to the heirs and beneficiaries. All right, Annalita, can you do the next slide? Thank you. All right, so this is Tony's bread and butter. Okay, <laughs> so we advocate for the needs of our clients. So um, we implement care plans um, for long-term care needs, if they need all text, if they need a spend down. Um, we want to improve the quality of their life. So if there's sustainability to leave them in their home, that is always our first goal. If they have the financial means and we get a doctor to assess them and a doctor says, you know what, right now, even though she needs a guardian, she only needs eight hours of care in the home a day, otherwise she can be on her own. That's the care plan we're gonna implement if the money is there to pay for it. Unfortunately, sometimes the money's not there, they don't have the assets to pay for caregivers then we may have to maybe look at selling their home and, fi and finding them you know, an appropriate placement for them. Those are things that we help with, but we provide an assessment. Our, our goal, like I said, is always the least restrictive environment. Um, we, we work with, so if there is family involved, just because we're nominated the guardian conservator does not mean we leave the family out of the loop. Our goal is to always work with the family. We always wanna do what the family deems is best as long as it's appropriate for the ward at the time. Um, one of the things that we advocate for medical needs is, is I had a client recently who went, so they called me up the group home and said, her, you know, her legs have edema. We think there's blood clots, but she's on hospice. We don't want to send her to the hospital. Well, if it's something treatable, I'm not going to let her pass away from this. You send her to the hospital, which the, the, you know, the EMTs even called me and they're just like, she's in hospice. Why are you sending her? Her advanced, she, she didn't code. This isn't, you know, this is something that we need to diagnose and see if it's treatable. Well, once there, they unfortunately did find out blood clots were in her lungs now from her legs and she tested positive for COVID. The hospital told me that they felt that it was a false negative for the COVID, but they weren't going to retest her and they were just going to ship her off to skilled nursing. And I said, excuse me, if you think it's a false positive, why wouldn't we do a second COVID test? Because if there's an option for her to go back to her care home where she knows people and can die in an environment where she feels loved and where she's getting one-on-one -on -one care, I don't want to send her to a cold, sterile, skilled nursing unit if there's a possibility she could go home. Well, it took me three hospitalists, a director, and I finally got my way. I got that second COVID test. <laughs> but I was going to advocate for what was best for her. Unfortunately, the second test was positive, but at least I know I did everything I can I could to try and get her back where she belonged. Exactly. Yeah, it's almost like, you know, having somebody in your corner and to fight for what is best for you. And that's what Tony does. All right. Special needs trusts. These are typically designed to provide for the specific needs of someone that is incapacitated and can no longer handle their affairs. Sometimes it can be from the uh, unfortunate benefit of being in a medical malpractice lawsuit. It could also be something that you are awarded from a car accident where you are then given like monthly stipends and things along those lines. Uh, special needs trusts are a little bit different than a regular trust uh, because special needs trusts are set up specifically with one person as the beneficiary of that trust and it acts as the sole benefit for that one person. It's not for the benefit of the entire family. It's not for the benefit of a married couple or anything along those lines. This type of trust is set up for someone that has had something happen to them. Um, for one instance, we have uh, one client that has a uh, astronomical amount that was awarded to her because she was in a car accident at a very young age. Um, and had, what is, is it? A TBI, a TBI a that's, brain injury. Yeah, I always rely on Tony for those <laughs> medical terms because I'm not very good at it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, she had a traumatic brain injury. We now, as her special needs trustee, take care of her. If she needs a new cell phone, if she wants to go find a new place to live, we act in her stead um, and in her place for those specific needs. We then handle all of her bills for her 
anything like rent, cell phone, groceries, um, taxes, filing her taxes. Those are something that's the weight that we bear because she's only in her 20s and she, you know, has a traumatic brain injury, but we're trying to give her the most independence that she can have. So these are things that she couldn't handle. So we've taken on that burden for her. Right. And the family didn't want to take on that burden either. So therefore we allevi alleviate right. that and it's act in her stead and allow her to have her great relationship that she has with her family. And they don't have to worry about this. They just want their daughter and they get to have that with her. Um, so that's the difference between a regular trust and a special needs trust. It's, it's solely set up for the benefit of one person that something happened. There was an unfortunate event where they were awarded a monetary, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? Like uh, not an award, but um, a small settlement, maybe like $50,000 for a back injury. Those aren't the kind of things we're, we're talking about something that's in the millions, something that they're going to get yearly stipends from, you know, we had one case where unfortunately there was a lawsuit against the Phoenix police department for the wrongful death. And the daughter was involved and she was getting hefty stipends every 10 years from whatever that lawsuit was. So we helped manage that account for her too. So it's, yeah, it's totally different. <laughs> yeah, totally different. And then every, every situation is totally different as well. So, um, but we're happy to do that for them. So we belong to a lot of different associations. We're obviously part of the fiduciary board, Arizona Geriatrics Association, Alliance of Mental Health. Um, we're um, also, uh, the care managers are CDP certified, which is um, dement, or I can't even think. <laughs> uh, we're certified in dementia care and pra uh, practitioners. Um, we're uh, members of the elder law and mental health section of the State Bar of Arizona. So once again, we, we do hold a lot of credentials. Right. And as fiduciaries, as a, as a requirement, once you do get your license, you are legally met, like responsible or mandated to go through a specific number of hours of training every year to make sure that you're always on your game. Uh, you've always got to be on your toes and make sure that you are up to date 100% with every elder law, probate law, uh, ethical rules and regulations. Um, there, there's, as you can see from our uh, memberships, there's, there's a lot of rules and things like that that go in place when you do accept and you get your license as a fiduciary um, to make sure that you are 100% or at 100% to serve clients that unfortunately can no longer help themselves or take care of themselves. So this, the next slide, please. There we go. Yeah. That's okay. one. So Jane Ann Geisler is what's called our principal fiduciary of our company. So even though there's other fiduciaries in the office and there's other people in the office, you have to have a principal fiduciary who is solely responsible. So Jane Ann Geisler is our principal fiduciary. Even though we all work under her, she's the one whose name and licensure is basically on all the court documents. So she's, she's been here since 1981. She has a very extensive background herself of working with the courts. And we're sorry it got cut off. We don't know what happened there. <laughs> um, but I mean, that's something we don't need to read all the way through. We just wanted you to have a little bit of background about this situation. And, and once again, one of the reasons I came to work for this company was I was impressed with the background and the social work aspect that we offer our clients. I you know, was unaware, even though I was a guardian to my mother at the time when I came to work here, I didn't even understand what I was doing or this whole other side behind it. And I think it was so weird coming from eating disorders, doing case management to coming over here. It was kind of like this was meant to be because I found my niche. I was my mom's guardian. I was dealing with a special needs trust. I was dealing with so many family dynamics that I honestly wish to this day that I would have had a fiduciary involved in my mom's case this whole entire time. So I'm one of those people that I can actually see myself on both sides of the fence and I can advocate and I can empathize with what everybody's going through because I've been there personally myself. Oops. And last but not least, our staff. <laughs> so this just goes through who we have in the office. Once again, a state manager, a state administrators, lead case manager, care managers, and paralegals. So those are the people we employ. And then we work outside with, you know, the law offices um, when we need them to handle cases within the courts. So that is the end of our presentation. 
right, now who's got some questions? Analita, can you unmute everyone? Or, or maybe raise your hand. Raise your hand on the screen if you have a question so she can unmute you. There's a What's lot that? of folks, so one second. There we go. Who's first, Annalita? John. I'm John. asking you to unmute. There John. we go. Okay, John Redman. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. I have a couple of questions. Sure. Uh, can an attorney be a fiduciary himself? Yes, they can. Financial advisors are also, are also fiduciaries as well. Mm -hmm. I see. And do you, do you encourage uh, your clients or uh, what is the value of an asset inventory? Is it uh, some value uh, that the client has established an asset inventory himself? Uh, typically not necessarily, it's not necessarily um, something that they say is of their value because some family heirlooms, like for my family are, there's, they're priceless to me. It's, you know, like my grandfather was a police officer and his, his initial weapon that was administered him, to him when he graduated the academy that might only have a $400 value, you know, assessed to whatever appraiser company, but to our family, it could be priceless. So every item has to be appropriately appraised by a licensed appraiser. So that way we right. can gain a better knowledge of what exactly in this day and age an item is worth. Um, same thing with real property. If you have a home up in Flagstaff, and you think it's worth 300,000, we actually would then go ahead and have it appraised by a licensed appraiser to give us that exact monetary value. I and see. that's what the court looks at too. So right. it's, it's, it's gotta uh, be an actual appraised value. My wife and I live in a life care community. Okay. And uh, we need a restatement or an amendment to our estate plan. We've moved here from Ohio. A couple of changes. Anyway, we have to uh, have a restatement done. Uh, I have uh, an attorney I'd like to work with, but that attorney is only doing these types of these types of meetings. And with something like this, I want to be in person looking in his eyes. <laughs> and um, I'm, I'm going to wait till uh, he, he does meetings in person. But moving toward a fiduciary, uh, the timing of that would be good uh, as uh, a spinoff from the attorney, would it not? Yeah, well, definitely, I think it's a little bit cheaper. I'm not sure as far as what attorneys can charge. I, I'm, I'm not sure either, but I do have like a meeting tomorrow with a lady who did nominate an attorney to be her fiduciary. But now she's in the position where she needs care management and the, the attorney obviously isn't doing that he right. just wants to do her documents he doesn't want to pay her electric bill or do any of that stuff so she's actually coming in to amend hers as well to to nominate our company to handle that aspect of it yeah. so because sometimes attorneys don't handle the estate management part and the care management part like an actual fiduciary office would yeah, right. I think yeah. and and i'm not specifically asking uh, in light of the fact of having the attorney be the fiduciary, but going to have the amendment uh, done by him mm -hmm. and broaching the topic of a fiduciary. Our situation is that uh, we have no heirs and we have no children. Right. So I need to have somebody experienced in this so that they can help do the nuts and bolts. Right. And... Um, uh, well, we have all our faculties. <laughs> right. Yes, we, we, we completely understand. One and of us is going to be a survivor. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, you're right. And, and, and coincidentally, in having the restatement of the estate plan, that is the time to broach the topic uh, of a fiduciary with the attorney, is it not? Yes. yes. 
this 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 attorney in theory could promote your company perhaps typically yes um i know like when i was in estate planning firms uh, what we would do or what I would do is present each client with a list of fiduciaries so that way it doesn't entirely seem one-sided and then you have the opportunity as the client to go out and meet with each individual uh, fiduciary to, to see which one you feel is the best connection um, or that we, you like better. We do have a lot of cl clients that call that say I was referred to by attorney so-and-so because I need a fiduciary for my estate plan. Right. And we get those phone calls a lot and we, we step up and we're absolutely more than happy to help with that. I see. Can a okay. connection be made uh, to a prospective fiduciary from a client via an attorney actually when they don't need it ahead of time? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. 100%. Okay. Let's move on. So we, um, John, if you have more questions, I'm going to send um, their contact information in the follow up email. So you Good. could, you know, but um, let's move on to Lou. Lou is um, next, I believe. And I think we have other people that raised their hand. Go ahead, Lou. Okay. A uh, uh, couple quick questions about advanced directives other than POAs. Mm -hmm. And the second part is Medicaid planning. So so Medicaid planning is something that we don't do. We'll, we'll help with all techs. So uh, Medicaid is, is pretty much what is considered all techs in the state of Arizona. So that is your Arizona long-term care, which is the state funded resource. Is that what you're referring to? Lou? You still there? Can you hear us, Lou? Hmm. Bummer. I think he might have had some connection issues. Okay. So I think Doug Godfrey yeah. raised his hand. Doug, what was your question? Are you still, are you still there, Doug? Okay, I, had to, yeah. I had to unmute myself first. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so what kind of guidelines or methods have you used to determine if someone is now vulnerable? So if I, like I work very closely with the sheriff's posse, I work very closely with the banner hospitals or other hospitals. I've adult made protective adult services. protective services I work very closely with, um, Phoenix Police Department, Fire Department. So they will reach out to me, especially the sheriff's posse here in Sun City West is one of our biggest supporters. They will reach out to me and say, you know what, this is the third time that we've been to little Betty's house and little Betty seems very confused and we've been trying to get her over to the hospital and we can't get her to go. Can you come in and see what's going on? So we go in and we do an initial assessment. I meet with her, I, I talk with her, I ask her some questions. Then, you know, first of all, I can walk into a home and they're very, I'm not sharing my financials. I don't wanna know anything, get out, go away. There are some <laughs> people who be like, here's my bank book. Do you wanna see how much money I have? Vulnerable, <laughs> right, Vulnerable there. right there. Yeah. So. I, I take all that information. I ask them for their doctor's information. We send a letter to the doctor asking the same information. This is what we're trying to determine if there's help that's needed. Sometimes it's it's a beautiful thing because when I'm there, I'll find out, hey, there's a daughter and there's a son that nobody right. knew about. We can call them and bridge that gap because maybe son and daughter didn't know what was going on. Right. But there's times when we, there's nobody and this person is definitely vulnerable. The doctor now has sent us a letter back saying, absolutely, where have you guys been? She needs help and so, we, we go through a whole process. It's the doctors, it's then you get the court investigator involved, you get a court appointed attorney involved. There's a whole process that goes goes into play here. Okay, Annalita, who was next? For, oh, I'm sorry, Doug, go ahead. Just one more question if I can. Um, a lot of people have a, a bank as a fiduciary, maybe a, a little bit of a description of the difference um, and how one of the difference, I'm a financial advisor for full disclosure, you know, um, how you would recommend someone rather than I believe the banks take that role uh, so directly. I had um, a financial advisor, it was one of the big ones, I think it was Charles Swab. Yeah. A gentleman reached out to me. He said, hey, I'm a fiduciary, but I'm not a fiduciary like you. He said, so I have a client who is definitely being exploited. All of a sudden they're coming in with, cleaning lady and she wants money constantly and I'm trying to shut it down but I don't have any authority can you help me so we were able to, to bridge in that gap for him as the fiduciary he saw a red flag but he's like I don't know if she's incapacitated I can't determine that I can't 
So he, I advised him to call Adult Protective Services on top of it. So that's always my first go-to. Call Adult Protective Services, then call us because we will work together as a team with Adult Protective Services to determine if, if it's valid what's going on, because sometimes it's not a valid situation, but we will we will work with that. If a bank reaches out to us, which they have multiple times and just said, there's some red flags here, we'd like somebody to investigate what's going on. I feel like their scope is is a little bit, um, they're, they don't have the experience like like we do. We have like this vast, you know, plethora of experiences, whereas a uh, Charles Schwab type uh, fiduciary, they might not know how or might lack the resources to go into the home and like Tony said, stop the bleeding. Um, a lot of times from what I can see is that specific larger banks don't want the responsibility. Um, I have a case right now where um, they want nothing to do with it. They were nominated and they don't want anything to do with it. So they bailed. Yep. They're like, nope, we don't, this is too much. We're not getting involved. There's so much of a family dynamic. We can't do it. We don't want the responsibility. So please take it over. So there's, there's that. When you have a bunch of different hands in the pots, a lot of times it's too much for, for banks to take on. By the way, I review estate documents for 90% of my clients and often recommend just for everybody else's benefit that they have a fiduciary as a backup at the end of their succession in almost every case. Good to hear. Good job, Doug. Uh, anyway, just a thought. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. And Alita, who was next? Did you have someone you were? Anybody else? You could raise yeah. your hand. Oh, Kay. Uh, I, I do have a question because my thought would be to uh, continue with a financial institution as my financial uh, fiduciary, but um, work with a firm like yours to do the personal care as I expect to be, as our first speaker said, by myself, and you know, I will need uh, someone to take care of my personal care issues, sure. but interface with a financial fiduciary, is that possible, probable, likely? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. We do it, we do that too all the time. But then were I to make a decision at this point hopefully not needing it for a few years. Do you charge like a retainer fee or how, how, how do you establish a, a, a setup of such an arrangement? So you are actually calling the shots. You're gonna tell us what you want, how you would like it handled, and we would go from there. So we would meet for an initial assessment and come up with a game plan together. And then go over a fee schedule as well. Right, absolutely. Tony right. or, oh, sorry. Tony or Lindsay, um, what happens to people who um, don't have anyone named and they have no successors at all? What happens to them? Um, like if they're, if they're alive and they're incapacitated, they become the state take kicks in. Is that what you were saying? It depends on their finances. So if, so say they end up over at the SAGE, the Jerry psych unit, okay? And um, they determine that they have nothing so they're gonna reach out to the public fiduciary, which unfortunately it is like every every other public entity. They're overrun, they, they got too many cases, they can't handle them all. So, but if there's any type of resource for these individuals, maybe they own their home free and clear, but they have nothing in the bank, or maybe they just, they have $150,000 equity into the home. We will work with that hospital who's ever calling us and saying this person's in need, we will work with whatever we can to get them discharged appropriately, go to the courts. So basically, yes, they would, we would step in, we would become the guardian and conservator if they had assets, help them do a spend down if that's what was needed and have them placed appropriately, or maybe they can go back home. Once again, we're going to follow the doctor's care plan and what the doctor is recommending us. But yes, if there's nobody involved, they've been deemed incapacitated. We just had a very kind of sad case where the mom was the mom is 93 years old. She was taking care of her son who was only in the six in his 60s, but he he had some type of brain injury from a car accident. from a car accident. She had no insight that he needed medical help. He he laid on his bedroom floor for four to five days because she didn't know to call anybody. 
And so he became basically bed sores that were basically caused infection and he was not able to recover from. He passed away from this. We had to go in and do an emergency guardianship over both of them because she had no insight. And that was her only family. Right. So now we're her guardian. We still have her in our home, but she just could not even understand that she couldn't even care for her own son and they had nobody but each other. So, and that was one that Adult Protective Services reached out to us. So we are helping her. Uh, unfortunately, she has the assets to remain in her home and that is our goal. So we went through the proper court channels and, and obtained that guardianship and conservator. So if you don't have any further family that could take care of you, if you become incapacitated, it would be a really important thing, um, especially right now with these COVID and so forth, to have some plans that name a fiduciary Somebody. to help you, even if you're alive and need assistance and you have no one to help you, right? Absolutely. We recommend you, if you have capacity right now, please do whatever you can. If you don't have family or friends, look into other private fiduciaries, look into somebody that can nominate, you know, that you can nominate because you want to be taken care of. You want somebody checking in on you and making sure you're doing okay. And you're not, we would all hate to admit it when we, you know, don't have capacity anymore, but you know, this poor woman didn't even understand what she was doing. And it would have been wonderful if somebody would have gotten involved a lot sooner to help them, you know? Yeah, definitely. Lou didn't get to finish because he had some connection issues. Go ahead, Lou. Yeah, well, that's okay. Just an, an, another new question. And that is, uh, do you have a list of care homes that, you know, the places that care for five or seven people that you deal with? So we don't have an actual list. I work with a, diff a variety of care homes in the vicinity. If I'm looking for something particular, I do have resources that are also part of the Benavia Cares Connect that I work with senior placement options. I have a few people that I reach out to when I'm kind of stumped and can't find the appropriate level of care or maybe fall within their budget. I will reach out to these people. Yeah, most people just trip over the care home option. Most people think the nursing home or the assisted living is the only place to go. Right. It's, it's really a preference of choice. My boss loves the group homes. You do get one, more one-on-one -on -one care. You really, really do. I, I honestly can say it. I'm a social butterfly. When I'm old enough, I want to go into an assisted living and I want wine days and I want craft runs <laughs> and I want it all. You know, I mean, yes. I'm not saying that, <laughs> that you're not going to get this, but a group home is a much smaller environment. It's a much more intimate environment. I had a client who was in his 90s. I placed him over at the prior Silverado, which was now the Auberge. He was miserable because he was such a loner. He hated every minute of being there. And I placed him in a group home, thriving, doing amazing. So yep. it's, you have to find that care plan that works for that person. Yeah, each specific. Yeah, the cost is also an interesting uh, uh, dynamic. Yeah. Uh, the care yeah. homes are generally a, a half or less than some of the other, many of the and other you can negotiate with them too. So, cause they're not, you know, owned by corporate. So care homes are That's nice right. because you can negotiate and we do that too. We sometimes the care home will come back at me with a rate and I'll say, it's not sustainable. I, I can't afford that, you know, for them. So I, I negotiate rates a lot too. Good. One other thing, since I have you, the, the percentage of your business that uh, is involved with uh, the various aspects of the business, like fiduciary only, and fiduciary and uh, care management and you know, the whole gamut. Correct. So we- In we other do, words, most of what you do is fiduciary and care management? So we have had families, once again, maybe they paperwork is properly set in place and a family is out of state. No, they we got it again. So, sorry. Sorry. Okay. So sometimes people have all their ducks in a row, paperwork is perfect, but maybe they're out of state, the children. We can be hired for just geriatric care management services only. Yeah. So I had a woman who was actually 108 years old, still living. Her daughter was 80 something years old and could no longer visit mom. So they hired us to just go check in on mom once a month to make sure mom wasn't being forgotten because they no longer could travel to see mom. So yes, we can be hired for just geriatric care management. And once again, you tell us what you want us to do. You you plan, You plan. we work together to come up with the scope of care that you want us and how involved and how little involved you want us to be under geriatric care management. Okay, it could be any of the, it could be both. It could be one or the other. We, yeah. we will step in wherever you, or wherever we are needed. We okay. have a question from, we have a question from Michael Piper. He said, do I need to redo my will 
to designate a certified private fiduciary firm, or may I do that in a letter of instruction accompanying my will, health care, and legal power of attorneys? Can you do an addendum? No, he would have to restate his will. Okay. Yeah. So he would contact the person that wrote up his will or do a new one. Right. Yeah, he could. Okay. Yeah, he could go anywhere. Like I said, any uh, state planning firm here uh, locally okay. or a uh, legal document preparer has those that capability as well. OK, I have wanted to someone asked about finding, you know, group homes versus assisted living facilities. And if any of you have that need um, or looking for attorneys that deal with elder law and things like filing for all texts. Our main phone number for Benavia, if you call and ask for the CARES hotline, we have um, organizations which we've vetted that um, we have relationships with that, that are like group home locators and they go and they help people find um, group homes or of course some of the, the assisted living facilities in town as well. And sometimes, not always, sometimes we have some attorneys in that group as well. So feel free to call the main Benavian line and ask for that assistance and that's free of charge. Pre-COVID you could come and meet with us in person, but right now we're doing only virtual. So are there any other questions today before we close up? Bob? Thank you. Following up to Michael's question, if you go to an attorney to restate your will, uh, do you have to have the actual name of the fiduciary put yeah. into the will? Yes. So you have to have that all decided before it you depends have. too. like a lot of times here in the state of Arizona, a business like managed protective services also has their own license fiduciary certificate number as well. Um, whereas you could nominate an individual li a licensed fiduciary, or you could also nominate the company itself as long as they have their licensure. Thank you. Yes, sorry. <laughs> did Bob, did you have another question, Bob? Is there a list of uh, uh, companies like yours available? Yes, you can, you can go on the Arizona Supreme Court's website. And I apologize, I don't have the direct link, but um, if you want to give us a call, I know that Daphne was going to send out our information. I can direct you to where to go for an extensive list of every single licensed fiduciary in the state of Arizona. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, I'll take one more question if there are any more. Tom had a I have a question. Oh. Yes. Uh, I was curious, how is uh, MPS organized as a business entity? Such as, do you mean are we legal, are we care? Are you a limited liability corporation? No, we are an incorporation. I'm sorry, could you repeat that, please? An incorporation. So we're Managed Protective Services Incorporated. Incorporation. Yes. yes. Okay. And, and what is the relationship of Jane Ann to the corporation? As of right now, she is our producer, uh, principal fiduciary and owner, okay. owner operator of owner the company. Operator. President, okay. I guess you could say. And I was wondering, just to finally, if in the minutes you can include uh, I'm sure you have some sort of an assessment pre-prepared of the criteria that one should use to assess uh, businesses like yours. And if you can include that with the minutes uh, so that we will know what what criteria to use to assess who might we, we might want to use as a fiduciary. Okay, so basically, so we don't have anything that actually says, with, I mean, you're gonna want a licensed fiduciary we don't, I mean, a licensure is the main thing that they need. Um, the criteria falls, I mean, if they can get their license, it's up to you what criteria you want. Not every fiduciary has social work, case management work. Right. So it's the scope of what they choose to do with that fiduciary license. So honestly, there's no criteria. It's what you're personally looking for. Okay, I thought you might have some marketing materials that would indicate clearly why you are the uh, fiduciary of choice. I mean, I can personally tell you why we're going to share. Well, we do have a oh, website. I, I, I didn't want, I didn't, I, I'm, I'm sure you can go on and on about that, but I didn't yeah. want to take the time now. Yeah, no, to, I, under, uh, I understand. 
we, we do have a website. All of our information is on that website. And okay. it'll go I'll send that. on why we would be the fiduciary of choice. Thank you. Yeah, I'll send the link to their website so you could peruse around with all the different, I'm sure there'll be a lot of details of the services they provide on that. Um, Relevant question? Yes, Lou? Do you have a, uh, a proposal possibility? In other words, someone comes to you and you say, well, we propose that we do this, 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 and this. That sort of addresses Tom's question a bit. Um, so once again, it depends on what we're doing. Are you looking for guardianship conservatorship? Are you looking for power of attorney? We, you know, we have so many, the trust, we have springing powers of attorney. So once again, it would depend on the service that you were looking for. Yeah, well, your you would needs. do that in a meet. In my understanding, it would be the same way as if yes. you went to an attorney or an investment right. banker, Correct. you would say, you, know. you would go meet, have a consultation. You'd say, hey, we go. I need this and I need this. I need this. Can you do this? Yep. That's probably the best. That's a service that you could provide. What? It is a service that you could provide. Yes, Easy. absolutely. Yeah. Right. Okay. So um, thank you so much for participating today. We so appreciate it. I will send a follow-up email probably late today or tomorrow with their contact information and the PowerPoint presentation. Feel free to call them or us if you have questions. Um, we can refer you to the right um, party. We so appreciate you both coming from Managed Protective Services. They are one of our preferred providers for fiduciaries um, that is a CARES partner. So we're glad to have them and, and speak well of them. Um, thank you so much. And keep on the lookout on Benavia's website for additional educational sessions. We have some related to care management and some related to financial um, issues such as estate administration and taxes and so forth. So, I hope you all stay healthy and well and that we get through this next year and get to come out again. <laughs> also sane. Yes, right. <laughs> Take care of yourselves, Thank everyone. You. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Oh, this is channel one. Yes. Mom, you want to